Hey, how's everybody doing today? So we're just getting started here. Um, thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm happy to be here today. And that's right, I'm at Absolute Dental. We're in kind of the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area of North Carolina. And um, just enjoying another lab day. But today I got a lot of great information for you guys. I probably have too much information as usual. So we'll see. I'm going to, my goal is um, get you all through it. And uh, hopefully we, we get to see some, some cool stuff. So I'm at absolute and I'm not advancing. One second. Let me flip this around. Technical difficulties, everybody. This is just live TV. Let me pick this one. It's probably going to be, got to be. So I'm just talking out loud. Let me see. Why are we not sharing? Can everybody see that? Yeah, we could see we could see your screen as uh, uh, the PowerPoint, but not in slideshow view. Not in slides, huh? is that if you go back to that i think there's like a little button at the top that you can press to start the slideshow yeah it's not um i see there we go it's gonna click off my mouse i guess so <laughs> sorry about that everybody that was a, a just mad dash clicking away but everything we're going to talk about today you guys can go ahead and scan this qr code um, it'll take you to Absolute's website. There's great information on there. There's going to be a lot of the protocol manuals that we wrote um, regarding a bunch of the information we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about all on X, which is the majority of what I talk about. But a lot of this information pertains to any implant restoration you have, whether it's a single unit or if it's a full arch, full mouth rehab. Um, everything kind of falls along the same lines. So when we were first talking and we we're gonna do this presentation and we were gonna talk about desks and desk components, I really, really had to think about it because everybody said, well, you know, tell me, tell me about desks, you know, tell me an hour about desks. And my knee jerk reaction, um, it's kind of funny, was I, I, I can't. I could tell you, you know, five minutes worth until I really dug down deep and thought about what desks and desk components mean to me and um, absolute. I've been using desks for, for years. I can't even count. Um, I don't keep track. And, you know, I use it for as much as I absolutely positively can. So on the surface, uh, to give you a 50,000 foot view, you know, do I use desk components? Yes, I do. Tell me, tell you a little bit about them. Um, they're great, kind of end of story. But if we really do a deep dive and get down into it, and one of the things I like to focus about that technicians and clinicians don't like to discuss a lot of times is money, is profit. Sorry, Jack, I don't think we could see your screen. You can't see it? No. Oh, no. Okay, let's do this. All right. Let's see. Share screen again. We're going to share this one. Can you guys see it now? We can see it, but we see your whole desktop. So yeah, perfect. if you click that, yeah, if you click that open a little bit bigger. Yep. Now can you see it? And then Yep, there you go. All right. Thank you. So, there we go. Um, <laughs> have that sorted out after a little while. Um, 
I that okay. So we were just talking about lab days and dental days, and dental people can understand only dental people can understand bad dental days, right? I have been having a bad dental week. Um, I'm always honest with you guys. I'm just like you guys. I sit at the bench the same exact way. And this has been that week for me. And it just doesn't seem like it's going to end. But anyways, with, with Des, um, you know, a lot of times we don't like to talk about that because you're not artistic or, you know, somehow it's, it's interfering with patient care. But it's very much part of our life. Um, I talk about all the time how I was the starving artist um, until I figured that out. It's, it's, it's very important. You're not any less of a technician or a clinician if you're business savvy. So that's kind of what we're going to take a look at. And we'll kind of take a look at some case studies and, and things like that. But I've been in the, before it was really even called the All on X game, for a long, long time. Um, my eye cream hides the fact of how many miles I've put on myself. But yeah, I've, I've been doing it for a while. And we used to do it completely different. Um, none of this that exists today um, was around. If you look at you know something like this, now this is old school. And uh, I hope nobody watching today is still doing these cases like this. If you are, let me know and we'll all get together at the end and have an intervention. But this is kind of a lot of what we used to do to get to where we are today. Now, if we look at all on X, uh, it is very much commonplace. It, it really has become, you know, kind of standard of care. Uh, and it's in now, every before it was kind of a, a niche. Um, certain technicians restored these cases and certain clinicians restored these cases. Now it's in every practice and every laboratory across the country which is really great because we're providing a great service to the patients. And they used to kind of go like this. This is prosthodontics 101, uh, wax, plastic, glass, and the final result, um, you know, monolithic zirconia now connected to a tie base. And the tie bases I'll, I'll use is they're gonna be deaths. Um, that's the parts. Now, it's not just the tie base. There's more to it than that. There's more that goes into it. If you look at your laboratory as a whole, where else can I utilize DES? Uh, the last time when I was talking with Fran, she said, somebody wants to get into DES right now. Where would you point them? What would you tell them to order if they wanted to place an initial order? Uh, analogs. That's the low-hanging fruit analogs would be the first thing I would start off with and just use all the analogs. They cover almost uh, pretty much all the manufacturers, major manufacturers, but let's look at it by the numbers. So we're going to look at typical components of an MUA all on X case, and this is going to be dollars per site. The most common parts or components that we would use is gonna be the multi-unit abutment analog. It's gonna be a tie base, a screw, an open tray transfer. All right, case sometimes if it's to the fixture and they gotta take another um, verified impression or if you're doing verification jigs, then you'll go ahead and use the open tray transfers to make your jigs. Uh, but if we look at DES, Desk, the analog is going to be 13 bucks. The tie base, that's actually supposed to say 35, not $3, because that would be really one hell of a deal. But I'm missing my five. They're supposed to be 35. You're going to get the screw for $13 and the open tray transfer for 40. Those are the most common components that you would use per site in one of these all in X cases. That total is $105. Let's look at leading competitors, Nobel. And Nobel's a funny one. Um, just as a quick kind of, you know, um, right turn to go off course a little bit. If you look at Des is 13 bucks for an analog and Strawman is 35, but Nobel is 20.99. Uh, the tie base is $60 and 68 cents. And the screw is 33.62. The open tray transfer is 30.34 for a grand total of 145.63. They don't use the flat numbers. Um, it's kind of random. Uh, when I actually put this together, 
I thought that was kind of interesting. Strawman, um, being the highest price out of the group here that's represented, $35, $95, $30, $55 for a grand total of $215, okay? So here we have them, um, just a snapshot of three in the industry today, uh, you know, ranging from $105 to $215 for, for the same components, difference between OEM and DES. The average of the two leading OEM competitors is $180, okay? So per implant site, that's a savings of $75. You might be like, ah, that's not that much. Well, now an average all on X case is gonna be four to six sites. So it could be 300 to $500 per arch, okay? That's per arch savings. Now per 10 arches is 3,000 to 4,500. Per 100 arches is 30,000 to 45,000. And per 1,000 arches, it's 300,000 to 450,000, just south of a half a million dollars. To give you an idea, um, most of my life is all on X and I am well north of savings that exceed half a million dollars a year. Okay. So just to kind of break that down to you guys, when you're like, ah, 75 bucks is not that bad. When you look at it, it really, really adds up. And if you're like me, I flat fee my all on X cases. So it's a flat straight fee. Okay. So if I make up any dollars anywhere between there, then that's all gained, okay? That's, that, that's a gain, all right? I don't, that's not, well, if I use this part, it's this price, and I use that part, it's this price. It's flat fee, okay? So, you know, that's why I can realize, you know, a savings of north of half a million dollars. OEM myths. These are my favorite, and these have really, really um, faded for the most part. Back in the day, early on, um, there was one company in particular that wrote the book on this, and that was nothing short of, if you put anything other than our OEM component in the mouth, the patient will die. Um, and, and so they spread this message across the industry and, and you would have clinicians that were just absolutely terrified. They'd be like, oh, you know, especially when we've seen things like Atlantis custom abutments come out, uh, you've seen industries completely rewrite their own books to kind of, to kind of counter this one message. And, and you've all heard it going across the industry. I've now seen a couple other companies pick it up. Interestingly enough, from the clinical side, most clinicians that I run into, they're, it's, it's, it is turned. So the clinicians you'll hear time and time again, and a lot of you have probably experienced this, is like, you know, it doesn't matter to me if it's OEM or not, right? Um, you'll see that with custom abutments. If it's off-label, you'll see that with components, okay? So that has been, that has been, you know, kind of an acceptance. We have lots of companies out there making components now. Um, DES has a huge, huge brand recognition within the clinical company. If you mention DES and again, within the clinical community, if you mention DES, more than likely your clinician has probably heard of DES. And they're like, oh yeah, I know DES. Um, it's kind of interesting. They have a really, really great amount of brand recognition on the clinical side, which makes our life easy. Now, this is something that I never ran into until I teamed up with Conrad and Dries here at Absolute, and that's screws, screws for multi-unit abutments. So I work a lot in prosthodontics, and my prosthodontists have every driver known to men. Okay. That's, that's what they do. Um, so it never mattered to me that every case that I sent out was a Nobel say Unigrip, right? Uh, because they had that driver. When I came here, um, I experienced a lot more of the restoring clinicians that only had the driver that went along with the implant system 
that their oral surgeon used. So if the oral surgeon placed Strawman, they had a Strawman driver. If they placed Nobel, they had a Nobel driver and so on and so forth. Um, what's nice about these is you can get the tie base. You can get the DES multi-unit abutment tie base. And then you purchase the screw separately. So you can marry up the screw with the implant system and the driver that your restoring doctor uses, okay? So that way you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about the clinician getting the case and saying, I have a Strawman driver, but this is, you know, a, a 50 hex. So you can go ahead and match your screws with the system that the restoring doctor is used to restoring with. It also has the angle base and it has the angled screw. Still today, um, and it's, it's pretty wild to me, but I'll run into instances, even with a 30 degree correction on a multi-unit abutment, that I will to that site go to the angle base. That gives me an additional 30 degrees. And sometimes it's been needed, uh, believe it or not, just ends up where we end up with the prototype. And I always blow the screw access holes through wherever they come out. That way, if we have a compromised site and I have a screw hole coming through the facial, then we can identify it and come back and replace that site with the angled base and angled screw. Also make sure in that instance, I send that particular driver to the clinician. Full face, full smile photos. Um, these are just some tips and tricks for you guys. Um, I'm a three shape guy. I'm sure ExoCAD has something similar, but we use this for all of our uh, full arch, full mouth cases. Even if you had a six through 11 or a seven through 10, it's really, really useful. And one of the things that's hard for me is really to get this, this photo right here. Um, it has to be taken straight on with the patient's head completely level, full face, full smile. And if you do that, then you can import that into three shape. And we can actually design the case within the patient's smile. Um, here you can see these gentlemen, it's gonna be a little bit of a test. Um, out of this group, which one do I think I would prefer as a photo to import. I'm going to pick this guy right here. I can kind of see both his ears. They're kind of level. Um, some of the other guys, their heads are tilted to the left or the right. You can see maybe one ear more than the other. But now knowing that, I'm going to let you guys decide and show you some images. And you tell me which one would be acceptable for a photo uh, to import into the design software. Probably not that one, or that one, or this one, or that one, but this one. This is a pretty good photo, and I'm still tilted a little bit, but that's not bad. We could go ahead and straighten that out. Mark the pupils, the midline, and size of ledge position, lips, and then we're going to go ahead and import the design. And that's, it's super, super simple. Um, it makes worlds of difference, especially when you're working on these cases and you could have a posterior left, right cant. The best, the best tool to sort that out is what you're looking at right here. And you know, it kind of looks like this, right? There she is before, there she is with the design. Now this is, this is a 3D facial scan gone bad. Um, you know, I joke with everybody, it looks like a cabbage patch or, you know, kind of like an Egyptian mummy, a scary one on the right-hand side. And, you know, um, we're pushing towards this all digital virtual patient and it's coming along quite well. Um, I'm kind of simple. I don't need to see the patient's ear to know where I need to move the midline. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of like that. So I don't really need it. Um, right now, what I use works exceptionally well. And so I just, I just keep going with a normal full face, full smile photo. It's gotta be straight on though. So all on X record gathering. 
This is as we're building our case. So we have our desk components. Now we're going to go ahead and start gathering those records. And there's, out of all my years, I've kind of broken it down into these two categories with the first question being patient presents converted or not converted. I will ask that question first because from that place, I have two different directions I can go. If they're converted, I could scan for a phase two, I could do an abutment level impression, or I could do it digital. If they're not converted, okay, that's a denture, then it's kind of game over. It's abutment level impression and opposing, or, or I'm going to steal an old technique and make it new. So a long time ago, and a lot of you have probably seen this, where the clinician would have a duplicate denture that the patient wore after surgery. Okay, that duplicate denture, the clinician would then go ahead and cut holes in and use it to uh, pick up the implant transfers and wash, reline it. And that would be and take a bite over the top of it. And that would essentially be your custom tray and what you would use to mount and give you an idea of where the teeth should start to go. Um, now, instead of duplicating a denture in an analog process, We'll go ahead and scan the denture. Um, I'll scan the denture. I will import it into mesh mixer. I'll put a little tab on the front of it. I'll poke some holes above the implant sites, you know, five, six millimeter holes, and then I'll print it out and send it back to the clinician. Um, super slick and really, really neat. It's worked exceptionally well. So if we're gonna go analog, Okay, we're going to kind of take a look at the old school process. Verification. Um, I cannot stress it enough. It is so, so very, very important. Has to be done, and I do it on every case. And there is a thousand ways to make a verification jig. Okay, everybody's like, well, what do you think about this one? And have you ever done them in stone and this and that and another thing? Um, I just simply make them out of acrylic. Uh, if they don't fit and they're not 100% passive, the clinician can cut them and relude them back together and then send them back to me. I don't like them picked up in an impression because I get them back and I just modify the master cast. Once you take an impression, you don't ever have to take it again. Uh, we'll just go ahead and keep altering that cast. And then if they're converted, one of the simplest ways to go ahead, because the problem, the next problem is mounting. So how do we mount this case? Okay. So we have our awesome master cast. Uh, we have a bite that's to the conversion and we have an opposing. And at this point, if you took a pre-op impression in the mouth, you can't use that to transfer over to the working cast. So what you do is you simply put the conversion on that master cast. You could see that the master cast is indexed at the 12, 3, 6, and 9 position. You'll put the conversion right over the top of it and just take a putty. Um, I'll then take that putty and inject it with acrylic, and I'll make a working duplicate that goes on and off the cast of what the patient's wearing in their mouth. First and foremost, that's what I could use to articulate the case to at least get us the, the video established to where the patient's at currently. Um, and then I'll use it for a pre-op. So everybody will tell me, I'll hear a lot of times, but we hate, we hate the conversion. The clinician hates it. Say I was a clinician, my patient hates it. That's absolutely fine. I need to know where to start out from hate, right? So, cause then otherwise I'm just guessing in the wind. But if you tell me we hate it because it's canted and the midline's off a millimeter and a half and six through 11 or a millimeter too short, then I can actually go ahead and when I import that as my pre-op scan, I can make those adjustments. If you don't use the putty, because a lot of times I say putty and everybody kind of freaks out, you could just take a PVS impression over the top of it. It serves the exact same purpose. And that's kind of what it looks like when I pour it up in acrylic. And that's what it kind of looks like when I mount it. Um, this one had some distortions, which, which some people have asked about, and that's totally fine. It still gets me where I need to be, basically in, in, in the ballpark. 
And it's all in the details when doing one of these cases. Um, it's often I hear when we're at the prototype trying, what am I looking for? Well, think of dentures. Uh, removable technicians do a great job at this because it's everything they do. Uh, if you're doing a maxillary denture, you're taking everything into account. The midline, the occlusal pain, the incisal edge position, the tooth shape, the overjet, the overbite. Okay, all of that is so very important. The gingival architecture, the tooth mold, are they, are they tapered? Are they square? Um, all of that is taken into consideration. You want to take that full face uh, smile photo and you have to take a bite. And you have to take a bite, I tell everybody, at every appointment, okay? Because they'll go ahead and remount, make adjustments, and then move forward. Now, we just talked about it's all about the details. Um, I see a lot. Um, I'm sure you guys are. If you guys are in your laboratories, I'm sure you do too. But this is an RX that I received for a prototype trying, a new prototype trying, because the one that we did needed some corrections. So this was the incoming RX. And please fabricate new trying. That's all it stated. Um, it didn't state why. It didn't state the changes that needed to be made. So it's very, very important to document all this. And not just changes that, that we know were wrong, that we can see with our own eyes, obviously. Um, hey, look, the midline is off. Um, but changes the patient might want, uh, you know, and I even strange and unusual requests. I'm working on a guy right now I call the cat man. Um, when I finish him up, you'll see, you'll see why. Here's another Rx that I received. Um, now that, that says right there, process these biatches, and that's the French pronunciation, uh, but that was an Rx I received. Um, for that was actually a double jaw case. Everything on these cases is directed from the chair. Okay, this is simple, simple denture, um, simple prosthodontic techniques. So all of the information on my RX, as you can see how big it is, there's not a whole bunch of little boxes to sit there and check. There's a gigantic space to write information. And that's why it's there. Not that information, that would be the wrong information. Um, but really, really important information because we want to prototype and you know the more information we get when designing the prototypes or designing another set of prototypes the less trians we'll have and the more accurate our trians will be okay so it's it's very very important it's all down to information let's look at this for example everybody watching this right now knows exactly what's wrong with that trian um this patient was not requesting to look like Tom Cruise, but at the try-in and with the full face, full smile photo, we could obviously see that the midline is incredibly off. So now we'll go ahead and take that, re-import this picture back into three shape, and we'll be able to design that midline where it should be, which is right there, about an inch over. You all also see this a lot. Um, it's perfect. Process zirconia. Again, relying on only the information that we have. I'll see this. So as you can see, very similar to the previous patient, this patient's midline is way off. Um, there's a lot going on with this case that I don't like. Even if you look at the, the canines, um, the midline, there's a cant. There's all types of things that could have been sorted out in another prototype try-in if we would have identified these. In this instance, luckily, um, the patient was thrilled and the clinician was thrilled. So at that point, there's, there's not much I can do, but they, they love the case. So I would say just, you know, always make sure that all of the details are covered. All on X digital. This one is uh, wild right now. I joke, I spent my whole life, you know, working on these protocols and workflows and processes to really button it down and get it incredibly accurate and predictable. And now I'm redoing it all. Um, it's kind of exciting. It keeps me on my toes, but it's like intraoral scanning and the restorative process. So 
there's a lot to go on with this. I mean, this unto itself is a complete lecture. But it's like the Wild West. Right now, I mean, I have guys that, you know, if they could scan the chair the patient is sitting in uh, so that I can import that into the design file, they absolutely would. Um, it's kind of all over the map. Instagram has a lot to do with it. Uh, dentists are like all of us, you know, we all, we all, even technicians, we all see it. Um, and we want to do just what we said, you know, just what we've seen on the Instagram post last night. But uh, this Jack will tell you yes, but this Jack will tell you no. Uh, there's a lot, a lot going on there. And, and I'm doing it right now. Um, and there's lots of laboratories that are doing it. But you got to take everything into consideration. Because uh, we're one foot in and one foot out. Um, a lot of it is there and a lot of it isn't. We have the traditional analog process. You got regular scanning. There's photogrammetry and photogrammetry has been making some, um, you know, big gains lately. And the photogrammetry and the scanning, you know, tie bases, it's come quite a long way. And it's, it's pretty much all there. I gotta be honest with you. Um, one of the things we do to kind of, you know, get the scanning itch scratched is what we call the phase two. So it's basically our master record gathering device it's compatible with all Nobel style MUAs. And in our phase two, we load them with the DES multi-unit abutment tie base. It can be used with any conversion, any existing prosthesis. This kind of goes through um, how to get the scan. And to give you an idea of, of how it works, we'll see if the video plays. Sometimes it's a little jumpy on, on Zoom. But you're basically going to take the conversion out of the patient's mouth and you're going to scan the conversion. So you basically place these phase two scan bodies into it, scan it, and then place it back into the patient's mouth. At that point, you could scan the occlusion, scan the posing, and send that file in. What I then make is the phase two device which is basically that conversion printed out, but it's sectioned between each implant site. And it's kind of got a high water basket design on it now. You screw it in place. You can adjust the occlusion as necessary, take a blue moose bite, loot it together with composite, and then inject underneath it with PVS. That in that one appliance, we now have our impression because I'm going to pour it, it's verified because we looted it together in the mouth. And then we went ahead and took a bite over it so we could articulate our case. And it's also our pre-op. And that's what a completed phase two looks like. This was a very, very nice job. Um, they were able to capture all of the ridge in the PVS. They adjusted the occlusion on it and they took a bite over it. It's kind of what the scanning of the conversion will look like. And that's what the phase two will look like. And there you have it. That's a completed one by Dr. Jeff Ganellis. And this kind of goes through some of the restorative steps. This patient was very particular in how she wanted to wake up from the surgery. So she wanted the diastema, she wanted seven and 10 rotated, and she wanted all that carried on from the surgical conversion into the PMMA that she wore into the final zirconia. I copy mill all of the all on X hybrids. Um, that started out with Dr. Lars Boma. He has his Technique he calls bio milling, where he will let the patient wear it for five to six months. And then when it comes back, he will send it into me, basically overnight ships it to me, and I will create the copy SDL file and send it right back to him. And, you know, when it comes to PMMAs, um, I've never believed in making ugly ones. Uh, I make them as aesthetic as absolutely possible. I just finished this case today with one of my art team members and Dr. Linder. This is actually one of his last cases he's delivering, um, delivered it this morning. 
So I should have some final photos of the zirconia, but that is going to be Flexera. So I use Flexera for all of my provisionals. I print them on my Einstein, and this is what I do with all of my hybrid temps now. If it's not like that, then there's this case, uh, which I did for Dr. Boma. And this one was printed with Flexera Base and Flexera Smile. And this was interesting. Um, this was one of the first that I did with Flexera. And it was in the mouth for five months. And you can see, I mean, a little bit of staining on the facials, not much. The intaglio surface was the most fascinating to me. Um, as you can see, it's pretty clean. I used to um, glaze them with GC OptiGlaze, but now I just polish them all. And I've been doing them this way and really good results. There's his provisional, there's his final. So it's just an exact um, copy mill of the PMMA. Here's another copy mill, Dr. Neil Starr. Of course, the PMMA is on the right because you could see you could cheat that far back MUA and really thin it out. But of course, in the Zerk, you can't. He went ahead and adjusted the tissue for delivery to get some more material around it. Gingival ceramics gone wrong. Um, you know, nowadays, these cases are so commonplace, um, but I don't use any layered um, powdered ceramics. Everything is monolithic zirconia. Um, to a tie base, and, and that is actually changing. We'll talk about it here in a second. But these are just things that I've collected over the years um, to show the ceramic side of it and what we as technicians can do better and kind of work to improve on. Uh, hybrids are a lot of fun and they become addicting once you get into them. And uh, it's always a push. It's the one on the right that it kind of has the giant flange monster, I call it, that's pretty scary. Uh, that, of course, as we know, one of the largest causes of implant failure is perioimplantitis. And when you flange them like that, you kind of walk right into it. So now I'm fast forwarding this all to probably what everybody wants to hear, almost totally modelless and totally digital. And it's the big Instagram lie that I was telling you about. Um, so a lot of what I've seen and I, I talked about this last year in a lecture I gave. Uh, there was a, a group of us, we, had, we each clinicians, and then I was the only technician, we each lectured um, on all on X and then did a uh, panel discussion afterwards. And a lot of times what's not being talked about, what we talked about that's not being talked about is when you see the fully digital hybrid, um, what nobody's showing is there is a cast. Okay, it exists somewhere. It has fiduciary markers cut into it, just like this one does. And the reason why, what, the main reason why is we still have to cement the tie base. Okay, the cementing of the tie base is it's, it's, I feel, I feel critically important. Okay, and I still cement to a verified cast. And this is a fancy one. You don't need one this fancy. You could simply take out the conversion put analogs in it and just set it in a stone in a base form or filled with stone. That's it. Cut some fiduciary markers on it. But you're going to place markers on the base. You got to scan the base conversion on, scan the base conversion off, scan the working arch, scan the arch with the conversion, scan the posing, scan the bite. All those scans. And then we'll put them together and you get your basically cross mounted digital scan. At that point, you could go ahead and we'll take the stone patty and you can put your scan flags or just your multi-unit abutment tie bases on and scan that back in. And then because of the fiduciary markers, you can model match it back to the stack scans. And there's a lot going on with this right now. Um, I'm going to let you guys in on something that I'm working on right now with uh, DES products that's pretty exciting, at least in the lab. But where we're at is um, pretty remarkable. One of the things I do in the lab is we, you know, based off of the volume of, you know, all on X cases I do, a ton of cemented. 
I have three guys that all day long, in, including overtime, because they work a ton of overtime, all they do is cement all day. So you got to think every phase two has to be cemented. Every prototype has to be cemented. Every PMMA has to be cemented. And every final zirconia has to be cemented. All right. That is a ton of cementing. Then a lot of times, actually most of the time, I will harvest the parts back out of the approved PMMA or prototype to use into the final. So that's a whole nother thing. So after they've done all these cements, I have three full-time technicians that all they do is cement tie bases. Okay. It's crazy. Uh, this was actually my brother's idea. And he told me, he's like, yeah, I don't do that no more. I'm like, huh? So I'm working on now trying to do my prototypes, at least my prototypes, at least my phase twos um, without the tie base. So if I use one of the desk scan bodies, I can go ahead and just print out the interface and that should save me for the cementing for prototype trines and such. It's just fine. Um, one of the things that's nice is I still do a small amount of, I do a digital version of bar wrapped acrylic. Well, I was buying the DES cobalt chrome tie base, okay? And then I was milling out my bar out of cobalt chrome. So now I have two like materials. I would then laser weld because I don't want to cement. I never liked cementing the tie bases to the bars the, the, for bar wrapped acrylic cases. And some people have, I could laser weld the cobalt chrome and the cobalt chrome. So now I had a laser welded cobalt chrome tie base to a laser welded bar. Well now, because it takes my guys how long to laser weld them, completely get rid of that and just use the scan body. Now I can just go ahead and mill it out of cobalt chrome. So it's been really, really helpful. And um, I'm just getting into uh, printing my prototypes tie base less, but from what I've seen right now, it's been really, really exciting and it's um, working really well. Even in the design, it helps you in the design so much. Um, it's faster. You don't have to worry about putting screw holes. You don't have to mark margins. It's, it's really, really nice. And you don't have to worry about the alignment of the tie bases. You know, sometimes the tie bases are kind of deep. Although if you're at multi-unit abutment level, you should be just about, you know, slightly subs, you know, equi gingiva or slightly supra. Um, but sometimes, you know, they could put the tallest one on that they have and you're still, let's say, you know, a couple of millimeters deep. Well, then you're only, you know, you only have the top of the tie base. And I've tried all types of things. I've tried putting little fiduciary markers on and so on and so forth. Uh, but it gets kind of tough with the scan. This way, you don't have to worry about that. And while we're talking about scanning full arch, full mouth cases, this is a brilliant study that was just released in the American College of Prosthodontics Journal. Uh, this was done by Dr. Chocolin Dacus et al., as you could see there. And it compared digital versus conventional full arch implant impressions. It was a retrospective analysis of 36 indentulous jaws. Now, I'm going to put on my glasses because I'm going to read the very bottom to you. Let's skip all the whole thing. Uh, let's get down to the conclusion. So basically what they did was they scanned 36 and they impressed 36 that were verified and then they compared them. They put them into a software, a reverse engineering software that would give them a detailed comparison and show them the discrepancies between them both. Discrepancies not only from themselves, but from the mouth. The conclusion was the 3D implant deviations found between the full arch digital and conventional impressions lie within the clinically acceptable threshold, okay? So the deviations were clinically acceptable. No statistically significant difference was identified between maxillary and mandibular jaws in terms of 3D deviations. So basically, in short, what was their findings? 
Well, they found that there was no statistical difference between the scans, no significant dis, uh, uh, difference between the scans and the actual analog traditional conventional impression, all right? Anything that they found that both had deviation, but both had deviation within the clinical threshold, okay? And compared to each other, there was no significant difference. That is huge because for a while, there was some studies and reports about, you know, inaccuracies within cross arch scanning. And we could see here from their study they just released um, that it doesn't show that. Now, why the change? I would say a lot of the change has to do with the advancements in the scanners and the software. Okay, that's it. They, they're continuing to advance and they're only going to get better and better and better. But right now, as it stands, if you used desk scan bodies, the intraoral version, on your all on X case, you can go ahead and be confident that it's going to be accurate. That study, if you're a huge geek like I am, um, and you want to read the entire thing at length, if you go ahead and scan that little dinosaur QR code, it will pull up for you and you can enjoy yourself. We'll take a quick look at the workflow. Um, I'm getting kind of short at time, but this is Dr. Mark Ludlow's scanning protocols. You're going to scan the posing, scan your seated temporary prosthesis, scan the bite, scan the soft tissue and the heads of the multi-unit abutments, and scan the scan bodies. Dr. Ludlow had worked for a while to come up with his workflow. And, you know, these are two studies that he released in 2018 and 2019 for scanning paths, the most successful, the most accurate scanning paths. There's your first pass, your second pass, and your third pass. And this is kind of what it's going to look like. These are his scans. And you can see what he's talking about here is you want to capture as much of the information in landmark areas as possible. You want to go back to the retromolar pad, but you just don't do it in the first scan. You have to go back to those areas in each additional consecutive scan because we got to put them all together. It's going to make the stack. Same thing on a maxilla. And this is what it's going to look like. This is what your digital cross mount looks like. Uh, you know, this in models, there's no stone, there's no mounting. Uh, this is all completely digital. If you really wanted to, if you had any concern whatsoever, you could gather all your records digitally. But then, if you were worried about it, uh, you could still take a conventional impression, pour that up, and import that impression into the stack of scans. So let's look at a quick case study and we will get wrapped up. But here's how this uh, gentleman started out. Um, he's definitely got a lot of issues and uh, we're gonna go ahead and restore him and double jaw all on X. Here's gonna be his prototype try-ins. Here is a bad mill of zirconia. Um, so I actually learned something. It's, it's kind of funny. It was from, from a clinician. And he said, why do you put sprues on the facials? I don't know, because I always have. So when I came back to the laboratory, just out of curiosity, I told everybody, stop sprueing the facials. They almost, they're like, ah, are you kidding me? And I'm like, no, stop sprueing the facials. Of course, I still have a, I have a manifold behind these, right? You know, centering, centering manifold. But we stopped sprueing to the facials and yeah, nothing has happened. Um, sometimes cautiously, depending on how big the arch is, maybe they put one, but not like this. And this is a terrible mill. If this comes out and, you know, it's, it's a crapshoot. Sometimes, you know, depending on how you have to nest it, they come out really good. And other times they come out like this. This is a bad lab day, okay? When you're green stage zirconia comes out of the mill and it's looking rough. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and take it and turn it into that, okay? And we're gonna go ahead and reopen all of those embrasures, define all of those gingival cuffs, put on our surface textured anatomy, all of the work will take place in the green stage. 
center it. We're going to apply meal. And there you go. So that is a huge, huge difference. And, and the rewarding part with these cases is, is exactly that. For these patients, um, most of the time, I don't get to talk to or have any you know, communication or interface with at all. Uh, it's really life-changing. And I, and I think you know, the, the workflows for this type of procedure, the technology and the materials have advanced and that's why we see it, it's so common now. Um, I do, I, I call it like a, it's a standard of care these days because we're able to get results like this and we're, it's easily achievable. I mean, now doing an all on X case is not easy by any means. There's a lot that goes on into it, but the processes and the workflows are far more advanced than they ever have been. And in this case, you could look at the is, I mean, it's a double jaw. So if my savings was, you know, 300 to 450 per arch, um, double that. And in this case, I would have had $600 savings. And in this day and age with everything getting more and more expensive, um, I don't feel that I've compromised or cut any corners, but I was still made a good business decision. So that is about that. Um, if you guys have any questions, you go ahead and email me, jack at absolutebellservice.com. Um, you can go to the website. As you can see, there is a ton of social media because Conrad and I uh, love to do a lot of social media. We like to do videos for the YouTube. Um, some of them are funny. Some of them are just ridiculous. And most of them are informative some way or another. Uh, whether it's a new material or a new product that is coming out, that's where we'll like to go ahead and do a short video and tell everybody about it. This is also where you can find out where I'm going to be next, um, where I'm lecturing, where I'm traveling to. I've been on the road for quite some time now. I've finally calmed down, uh, but I hit it hard in the beginning of the year and I'll be back on the road come the fall. So I got a little bit of a break, not much.